Funding for Elwood City Limits is provided by John Dulong, Josias Melendez, Leanne S., Christopher Ifill, and Ian Collis. Listeners like you. If you'd like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. Lucas? Yeah, Will? Did you know that Elwood City Limits is nominated for an actual award? What? And it's not the award for worst podcast? It's actually the award for best podcast in Halifax? Who could have seen that coming? The Best of Halifax Awards 2018 are coming up very, very soon. Lucas, how can people vote for Elwood City Limits to be the best podcast in Halifax? Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for helping us get nominated in the first place. And if you've done that, then you're familiar with the process. All you have to do is go to bestofhalifax.com and then pick the news and media category. All you have to do is scroll down to best podcast and vote for Elwood City Limits. You just have to type in your email and you're all signed up. And this really helps us out. Uh, it's an honor to even be nominated. So... Please, for the month of August, vote for Elwood City Limits to be the best podcast. And when's the last day they can vote? The last day they can vote, it's essentially August 1st to September 15th. All right! Woo! Funding for Elwood City Limits is brought to you by Facebook. Facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits. Twitter. At ECL Podcast. Tumblr. ElwoodCityLimits.tumblr.com. Email. ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com. And by contributions from listeners like you. Literally at ElwoodCityLimits.Libson.com. Thank you. Cha-ching, cha-ching, baby. <laughs> Well, it's a little bit different uh, than we've been doing it the uh, the last few times here on Elwood City Limits, the episodic Arthur podcast for a variety of reasons. Uh, well, first of all, it is nighttime right now. Uh, Lucas and I we have been doing a lot of morning recordings, so hey, it's been the it's been the end of a long day. I apologize if maybe I'm not as Woohoo! Got that crazy morning energy as we were talking about before. That, that big pickles energy. That, that's right. <laughs> and hey, there's the other big difference here on Elwood City Limits. My name is, of course, Will Young. But today we are joined by a very special guest who reached out to us on Twitter, and I was, uh, well, a little bit surprised to see somebody from this corner of uh, the internet. Surprised in a good way because I never really would have thought that there might be a connection between the world of esports and the world of Arthur, which is where our guest comes to us from today. In fact, if you're up on esports uh, and with uh, the recently happening Evo, uh, you, it might be a new interest of yours upon hearing about it uh, through Twitter, through social media, through the internet, and what have you. But you may recognize the voice and name of our guest today, Justin Avargis, a.k.a. JV. Hey, Will. Thanks for having me on board. And I'm really glad that you actually brought up Evo. You know, given uh, you and, and Lucas's proclivity to talk about uh, wrestling on a daily basis. I do have to ask: is is that a slight confirmation that y'all are fighting game fans, perhaps? Ooh, okay. So that's a bit of a hmm. Uh, <laughs> I have friends who are devoted fighting game fans. In fact, they had an Evo viewing party when it happened uh, a weekend or two ago. I but I'm, but I I have to I have to admit. It's a little bit outside of my video game comfort zone. I'm not very good at fighting games at all, and uh, when I when I when I've watched Evo and stuff with my friends, I feel like, uh, uh, well, t to be honest with you, I feel like I'm watching a sport, which I'm not much of a sports person. But there is in the in the presentation of it all, uh, it really does kind of ring similar in that I uh, feel like there are a lot of terms that I'm missing out on. Uh, there's a lot of the, the, the action can get fast and frenetic as with, you know, this year's, uh, uh, Dragon Ball Fighter Z. My gosh, that was hard enough to follow as it was just with the naked eye. I felt like I was Gohan trying to see, uh, Yamcha and the Cybermen fighting for the first time. <laughs> 
Uh, so, Great so, reference. <laughs> so, in, so in short, no, I'm afraid I'm not much of a fighting game fan. Nothing. I'm not anti-fighting games by any stretch. I'm just really not very good at them. Lucas, I think, might be a little bit more into that world than I am, but I can't speak for him, unfortunately. Yeah, you know, I, I suppose when it comes to my actual experience as a player, uh, I'm more akin to platform fighters. Um, Smash, especially uh, for the Nintendo 64, has been a really big part of my life and, and was definitely where I got my start in commentary uh, in the esports world. Uh, but I love, love, love watching traditional fighters, especially uh, at EVO in particular. I mean, I, th- I think it's just, you know, the, the size and the scope of EVO in general. Um, and the general narrative, right, of, of having somebody who has to cut through literally a myriad of competitors, right? Like you look at mm-hmm. a game like Dragon Ball Fighters, for instance, I think there was over 2,500 competitors in that game alone, right? And for at the very end of the day, for there to be one champion of that pool of 2,500 people, I mean, that to me is absolutely incredible. And the fact that that ability to be a champion is open to anybody, right? Who can, you know, show up to the venue and, and pay the venue fee, I think uh, speaks volumes to um, the inclusivity of the fighting game community in particular. It's a really, really, really unique experience for sure. What really uh, speaks to me about the fighting game experience, you know, it's it's not for me, but I can see why it works. It was all the stories that came out of Evo about, you know, uh, Sonic Fox and all this, all the kind of stories that were happening. For me, it kind of has the same uh, uh, representation in my life as my feelings on MMA, where it's something that, like, I wish I was more into because I can see the stories, I can see the characters, I can see the action, and... and and really see how they work for the people who love them. But I already have professional wrestling, and that really scratches that itch in a way that specifically works for me. So unfortunately, it is a little bit outside of my grasp. But I do really enjoy hearing about them, and especially um, the the narratives at play at a, at a at an event the st- the size uh, of Evo. So I'm glad that we I'm glad that we started off about that. Now, were you involved with Evo at all, or have you been in the past? Uh, no, you know, I uh, tend to uh, just watch Evo as a spectator more than anything else. To be frank, um, a lot of the commentary that I've been doing um, in the past year or so isn't really as fighting game uh, oriented. You know, I've, I've been blessed to have uh, had opportunities to work with DreamHack and with, with Blizzard on, on a couple of things. Uh, so it's, it's definitely been a shift for me in regards to what I do cast. But that mm-hmm. being said, I, I'm definitely a, a really big fan of just taking an Evo in, in whatever method I can. And, and typically that's, that's on my couch or at my computer, though in, in more recent years, it's been really cool to see Street Fighter, for instance, on ESPN of all places. So very, very cool, I think, seeing just the, the growth of esports as a whole and, and in particular the fighting game scene just... Um, finding all these new mediums to to really broadcast uh, their mecca of events. So I, I I guess we can say that it's a not yet for working at Evo, but never say never. That would now that <laughs> now that would be a that would be a guaranteed draw for me as if JV was commentating uh, at an Evo. <laughs> Just like oh man, gotta tune in for that. <laughs> well, we go from fighting games, which I mean we were going to talk about at some point for goodness sakes, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, let's let's let me pivot by asking you, um, what's your experience with Arthur? Because it was on Twitter actually that we kind of found each other, and uh, I had the familiar. I think it's the same way that Jordan Taylor and I kind of uh, initially got hooked up of just like, oh, there's an Arthur podcast, gotta listen to all of these, and then you kind of uh, put your best foot forward there. So, what's your experience uh, with Arthur? Well, with Arthur, I think that my story is, is very similar to many 90s kids who never had cable uh, in the sense <laughs> that I would come home from school um, every day um, and on the weekdays, it just happened to coincide that whenever I'd eat the snack that my mom would prepare for me so lovingly, uh, Arthur would be on. And so I'd, I've been watching Arthur um, probably from t- the, the very, very early 2000s onwards. I'd say at least 2001 onwards. Um, and I kind of kept up with it all the way until I got to college. Now, when I hmm. went over to college, you know, I, I, I was a total cord cutter, to say the least, so I mm-hmm. didn't really have access. So a lot of my Arthur knowledge in general is... Uh, I'd say um, a little into the second voice arc, 
I guess is how I describe it. Um, okay. Or as, as my brother and I discuss it, it's, it's when he goes into puberty, but then reverses puberty to a significant degree <laughs> where his voice is even higher than the original voice. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, but it, regardless, I think that Arthur has always held a really, really special uh, place in my heart. And so for me to stumble upon an Arthur podcast of all things, uh, I think it was just uh, such a blessing to say the least. Um, and, and myself, as well as some of the friends that I've shared it with, have had a great time uh, listening to it over the, uh, the the past couple of weeks. So it's been a lot of fun. It's It's been a good time for sure. Well, I'm certainly glad that you found us, and I'm even more glad that you've uh, decided to be a guest on the show. So today we are indeed tackling one of the mainline uh, Arthur episodes here in Season 4. We're coming up to the end of it, and I feel like I say that every episode. I'm just like, oh, we're getting close <laughs> to the end. I, I'm pretty sure that next week is the last episode of Season 4, or next next ECL episode. So we really are close to the end now, but uh, we're starting off today. So I sent you the link for you know i i usually send lucas or whoever's co-hosting with me the link and then just like you know here's the episodes we're talking about make sure you do notes and everything and you took a look at it and you were like oh this is the bobbin episode yeah i mean i knew right away what is that thing um i'd say in the arthur infinity gauntlet of of still culturally relevant (laughs) things or at least things that i've taken away from arthur um, you know, to a lesser degree of Jekyll, Jekyll, Hyde and having fun isn't hard when you got a library card, Arthur Fistbeam, et cetera. I'd say a bobbin is, is right up there, right? Just like as, as a random tidbit that I've had. Like to me, I guess just to make a reference to maybe a, a more uh, modern sh- uh, cartoon of sorts, um, Phineas and Ferb had an episode that was about aglets, right? Which okay. is like the, uh, the bit of plastic that's at the end of a shoelace. And it had a very similar effect on me that, that the Baba did in the sense that it's like you hear the word in the context one time and you have like this bit of trivia that's just embedded into your brain for the rest of your life. So that's how I knew right away it's the Bobbin episode. <laughs> well, I'm glad that it left such an impact on you. And I mean, I also knew immediately what it was, uh, even in comparison to the uh, to the second half of this episode. So let's get into it. It is the episode called What Is That Thing? Actually, uh, I, I tell a lie. I am interested in one thing. What was a typical snack that your mom would make you when you would watch Arthur after school? Oh, man, how much time do you have? Okay, so, so, so this is a multifaceted question for sure, right? <laughs> Me being, um, you know, re- being Indian, um, you know, you're, you're akin to all sorts of different snacks, right? So that could be something uh, pretty standard, you know, some PB&J um, and some chocolate milk, maybe some, a grilled cheese. Classic. But then also some occasional, uh, you know, South Indian dishes um, mm. like erachi, which would be essentially... Uh, Fried beef with with coconut is, I guess, the Ooh. rough translation of it. It's, okay. it's really good stuff. It, let me tell you. I, people tell me all the time. They ask me, "Hey, man, what's a really good Indian place that I should eat at?" And I, I give them the same answer. None of them here. They're all garbage. You have to go to my mom's or to my aunt's. That's the only places that you can get good <laughs> Indian food in the Dallas area. I'm sorry. And if that shot's fired at one of your <laughs> listeners who happens to own a uh, an Indian culinary establishment. Step up, man. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. JV is calling out all restaurateurs in the in the Dallas area, especially those uh, of Indian cuisine. Step it up. <laughs> Get good. Uh, no, I know exactly what you mean because my uh, part of my family is uh, is Polish Ukrainian, and I'll tell you this: there is pre- there is no. Um, major retailer of pierogies out there that can make them as good as my mother can. So I absolutely understand your struggle, uh, at least in the in the in the sense of food. There, I think we're both just biased, right? And, and I'm sure <laughs> that that's probably something that's shared uh, among most people is you just can't beat your mom's cooking, you no, know. It... Especially whenever it comes to those staple dishes. Oh, mm-hmm. it's 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 a it's just unwinnable matchup. It's literally an unwinnable matchup. Man, oh man. Uh, good thing I ate before we started this or else I'd be getting hungry. Okay, so what is that thing? It was one that we immediately recognized. And the episode starts off with a uh, cold open of, as as we like to say, Arthur Ferris Buellering to the camera. He is talking about the how some objects can be particularly versatile and they can have different uses. Um, uh, in this example, it's like, uh, old tires can be used as tire floats and tire swings. They're like located at like a local 
uh, lake or swimming hole or what have you. Binky uses a reed as like a spitball. Uh, we also get a flashback to uh, caveman times here. I think this <laughs> might be our first instance of cave varks uh, in in the show so far, and it's of <laughs> the ca- the cave version of Arthur. Uh, the prehistoric Arthur who is creating fire with like a bow and arrow and by using friction. So uh, what did you kind of make of this uh, cold open, JV? So many things. First <laughs> off, um, and something that I'll, I'll, I'll allude to later on as the, uh, as the episode pro- progresses, because I think it's a shared theme, is the Arthur universe, the people there say, you seem to have a, a balance of incredible premonition and the worst reaction times I've ever seen in my entire life, right? <laughs> um, and, and I think that that's really evident, especially whenever you jump a, a little bit ahead and, and DW says, I know what a big brother can also be used for, right? And Binky, you know, in, over the period of five seconds or so, says Cannonball, drops down, splashes Arthur, where DW's perfectly crouched, you know, behind him. And, and I, th- I thought about that interaction in particular, and I try to pay attention f- to the rest of the episode to see if there are any other instances of that. And sure enough, there are. Um, and I'm sure we'll deep dive into that later on. Uh, one thing in particular about the cave scene, first off, once again, huge props to the animators uh, doing an excellent job of capturing a, a new Arthur aesthetic and doing it really well. You know, it reminded, it reminded me of the, uh, the contest episode mm-hmm. with them experimenting with different animation styles and, and still doing a great job regardless. But one thing in particular that, that made me laugh really hard with the, uh, with the um, cave uh, flashback in particular was... Arthur saying, one of the world's greatest geniuses of all time discovered fire. And it's literally Arthur, of course, <laughs> being that guy. And, and the beautiful follow-up callback with DW bringing out the fire drill hat. That was, that was incredible. Absolutely incredible. Arthur does have a streak of egotism in him that comes out in his kind of worst moments. Uh, I, was kind of, I was thinking back to this. It was, um, oh gosh, I don't remember the name of it. I think it was in season three. Uh, go back to the previous ECL episode for this kids, but it was, uh, uh, Arthur kind of being the big shot when his dad was making all the desserts. And just like when you're, when your mom's doing up the next bake sale, tell her to give me a call. Oh my God. Ar- there's something in particular about Arthur with an ego. It's, it's just, it's like, come on, man. And, and, and I think that the second episode uh, that, that's tied to this really touches on this, but Arthur is one of those folks, if you were playing an RPG, like, he wouldn't be incredible at anything, right? Like, very, very Mario-esque. It's just, just yeah. middle of the road, like, pretty decent at everything, you know? Maybe I give him a couple of points uh, for reading comprehension, but that's pretty much it, man, to be frank. Well, and uh, not to not to get into heavy to spoiler territory for a later Arthur episode, but uh, as I recall from the uh, the best of the nest uh, duo of episodes, he's among all of the roles in the best of the nest video game. He's just plain goose, so he's kind of like your standard uh, action character, just kind of mi- f- fives across the board. Not exactly great at anything, but not terrible either, and which is something I relate with. I relate with Arthur a lot, as if you've been listening to the show, uh, is both a good, kind of a double-sided coin sometimes. A little bit. I, I will bit. say, if you're looking for the perfect intersection of esports and Arthur, I think Best of the Nest, that'll do it. Can you imagine Best of the Nest tournaments? I can't. They would be horrible. It would literally be kids on stage answering questions for like 36 hours. It would it'd be, it'd be unwatchable. I'm, I'm calling it right now. <laughs> We're going to have to get your insight on when we, when we kind of <laughs> move up to that one, so uh, stay tuned for that one. That's coming sooner than you'd think. So the episode starts off with DW being the little sister role to a T and asking a great deal of questions and you know of just like why do why do why do donuts have holes and who made the donut who made the donut hole and i just put here dw needs wikipedia <laughs> did you wikipedia any of these to figure out who made the donut and who made the donut hole I, i'll say that i did not do my due diligence as a guest on this particular <laughs> tidbit well neither did i because my childhood curiosity has all but been extinguished uh <laughs> these days so no don't worry neither did i um and so arthur kind of has to look after dw for a bit because uh his parents mom and dad reed are paying taxes which is very much done in a way that I'm not sure tax paying is done. I, I like. I guess this is a weird thing of like, 
you know, adulting and what have you. You know, I, uh, you know, <laughs> this is a bit embarrassing to admit, but I give my taxes to my mommy and she does them for <laughs> me. <laughs> Next year. I was- <laughs> I'm just going to say, Will, I'm just going to say, I expected a lot more organization out of Jane Reed, who literally does this for a living, right? Like, they just have all their papers <laughs> scattered around the dining table. Come on, Jane. Bring a little bit of that work mojo in. Those receipts are everywhere, my dude. And they're using, like, the old school adding machines and stuff like that, the one that, like, creates a receipt as you use it. And I'm like, who does this anymore? Man, these like, are the pre-Turbo Tax yeah. days. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Oh, God. The fact that I made that joke just made me feel so much older than I actually am, Will. I'm not going to lie. Having a uh, bit of an existential crisis in my loft right now. <laughs> well, next year I'm going to be right there with you because once I'm married, my tax situation is going to change drastically. So I'm going to have to do it myself. Uh, cringe, cringe, cringe. <laughs> Will does it himself. Like, I see the Arthur title card and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Will does it himself. Credits. <laughs> Now, would you be the symbol crash, or would you be be turning into a frog? Like, oh like which my title card would you be? God, what a great question! Oh, I've never thought of this before. I'm gonna steal this for next week's episode uh, when Lucas is back. Oh my, that is, <laughs> ooh, that's terrific. Okay, um, I'm gonna say my 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 gut reaction is that I would be the one of Buster burping, and Arthur kind of laughing at him. You know what I mean? You remember that one? Yes, yes, absolutely. Because sometimes he sounds like a T-Rex and other times it's like a normal burp. It just yeah. depends on the episode. They didn't do the burp as many times as I thought, but the burp is the funniest one. So that's, I, I don't know. I feel like that, that, one is, that one is the one I would want. What about you? I think that the one that probably captures me the most would be the one where it's Arthur with his hands up like, yay, and then a thunderstorm happens, and he's just <laughs> like, all right, well, guess I got to bust out the umbrella, and he's still smiling at the end, right? Because I like to think that I'm a pretty flexible person. That being said, I feel like the DW accidental creeper one is probably my favorite personal intro. That one's hilarious to me. Nice. When he, when the one where he she's where it's like Arthur taking a bath and she pulls apart the curtain and he literally sinks and you can just see his glasses above the water. Too good. Too yeah, that, good. Yeah, that was a good that was a good late game addition for that one. Great question. <laughs> I love it. Arthur is trying to kind of get somebody to help him look after DW. He calls Buster and we get another instance of Buster trying to do a writing contest for a kids show after we did a episode literally called the contest about it. He's trying to submit his own idea to Bionic Bunny uh, who are doing a contest where, you know, you can submit it and if it wins, then they'll make an episode about it, which is uh, Kind of funny to me. It seems like that's just a gimme for the writers, maybe. Is, is that a thing, Will, that, that happens today? Because I feel like that needs to be some sort of an option for kids today to just write in and maybe produce uh, an episode of sorts, right? Like, I don't see that anymore. And, and to be frank, this was coming out whenever I was Arthur's age. And I don't remember ever there being like a writing contest where I could influence a show. Um, I don't have a great memory for that either. I mean, I want to say that it's not out of thin air, but it's it kind of seems like more of a joke than anything else of just like, yeah, let's let a kid write this, sh- write the show. Ha ha. Like that had ever happened. But I, 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 can't, I can't confirm or deny, but I'm sure we'll have somebody in the emails in the coming weeks who will, uh, who will swiftly tell me about one of those. I don't have a great memory of too many, uh, contests from kids shows, unfortunately. I just want to see a South Park response of like South Park versus Bionic Bunny or at least some sort of Easter egg, maybe in the next Stick of Truth game, something like that. That would make me a really happy camper, not going to lie. Uh, Arthur is, uh, so Buster's busy writing that TV episode. Uh, Francine is busy because she's trying to kick Nemo, her cat, of a phobia of water that he's developed. And this led me to the question, can cats have phobias? Like, I'm sh- I know cats can be like, afraid of stuff you know i've seen those videos of like somebody putting a cucumber next to a cat and it's just like jumping but can they really have like human phobias well my cat in particular has um a human phobia in the sense that she's terrified of, of human beings that aren't myself or my wife and and even sometimes myself and and my wife um so maybe i'll give it a qualified maybe i will okay. say that this scene uh actually 
I, I felt like I, I had some flashbacks of sorts watching this scene because very recently I had managed to accidentally knock over uh, our cat Emma's bowl of water uh, onto her little cat tower where she resides. Mm -hmm. um, and my wife, you know, what happened next was my cat immediately ran downstairs to basically lay witness to what had just happened. I think she got a little scared because her paws got damp immediately, so she gets into the corner. And she just spent, like, the next minute or so just hissing at my wife as she was trying to clean up, you know, the, the, the outcome of me knocking over the bowl. So I could kind of relate a little bit to Nemo through my cat, Emma, I guess, of that, that slight fear of water, though I think that Emma probably has it to a, to a significantly lesser degree than, than Nemo does here. Yeah, Nemo, even at the sight of the water in the dish, like jumps up on Arthur's head and it's 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 sunk into the degree that like when Francine removes the cat from Arthur's head there's like a snapping noise it was so painful looking oh my god the the amount there's a couple of instances of elasticity of body elasticity in this episode <laughs> that, that <laughs> definitely freaked me out right i feel like you know there's there's got to be some sort of edit in particular that where it's it's you know that one scene of 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 Francine yanking Nemo off of Arthur's head just quickly transitioning to a happy tree friends clip like it was too close, too close for comfort. Muffy, uh, Muffy's excuse is that her uh, a doll of hers has unfortunately been lost down the sewer, and she's trying to get it back. We've talked a lot about meta and uh, ref like interior referencing in Arthur, and this is definitely as meta as it gets. She has what she calls an anteater doll, whose name is Arnie, and what it is, it's basically if Arthur didn't have his glasses was on all fours and wore a... Well, he does wear a yellow sweater. So it's meant to be, like, basically a parody of the talking Arthur dolls, I guess, that used to be around in the late 90s. It was a weird one. It was weird. And, and, and for me personally, the scene doesn't make a lot of sense because you see Muffy just trying to figure out ways where she can retrieve this doll. First off... You're a crosswire, all right? You literally have money growing on trees. You could just get a brand new doll, right? There wasn't there that one episode where, where Muffy was clowning on Arthur for almost picking up his lunch that was in the bag that happened to fall out of his locker onto is, the floor? This is and a great, here she is. great point. Great point. Right, and here she is totally doing a 180, being like, oh, man, I'm so dejected. It's not like my dad could literally Amazon Prime me a brand <laughs> new doll in an era before Amazon even exists because crosswire, crosswire money is that crosswire money. Instead, she's just sitting here. But then again, I totally get it because I think that this is the true John Legend doll. I mean, this looks more like John Legend than even Ooh, Arthur does. Just saying good a lot. call. Good call. Yeah, we're going to have to throw that one up there on the on the social and see if uh, Chrissy Teigen uh, takes notice of that one because I think you might be onto something there. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised. You know, John's probably a good dad. He's probably playing with his kids saying, pull my nose. I don't know. That just <laughs> makes sense to me. Sure. Uh, there's a great one here. So Muffy is busy there. Arthur goes to the brain who's trying to build a model airplane, a remote control model airplane, but he's having trouble with it because he's missing a part. Uh, and Arthur says, let me guess, you're just going to take it up. You're just going to sit at home and mope. And the brain responds with, no, I'm going to take it apart, send it back to the company, then sit at home and mope. <laughs> I always appreciate when characters are uh, resolved to feeling miserable. Yeah, that, that was that that whole sequence was was pretty funny to me. Um, and, and I'm not gonna lie, right? If if we're going down this this friendship progression of sorts, mm -hmm. why doesn't Arthur ever just ask Sue Ellen to hang out? Right? Is he still kind of weirded out by the by the diary and and Sue Ellen maybe or or possibly not having a crush on him? Like, what's the deal? I feel like going to Muffy pre Sue Ellen or, or even going to Muffy before you go to Brain just doesn't make sense to me unless it's just a, a geographical thing more than anything else. Yeah, I, I I got no answers for you there. Maybe she's just not in the in crowd yet. She's not in the she's not part of the NWO original. She's on like the B team. Your your guess is as good as mine, but that's an excellent question. He did he was certainly he was not Arthur is not lack for friends. So he could have kept going if he wanted to. But who knows, maybe he was on his way to Sue Ellen's house when he finds, well, what we later understand to be a bobbin, but, uh, well, all of the kids are baffled as to what it is. Arthur comes across first, and as the episode goes on, 
we see it go to each kid in turn and they use it for their own device devices. Uh, Arthur doesn't really have any reason to use it, but he thinks of a couple things that it could be used for. And so in a couple of imagination sequences, he thinks it could be a yo-yo for leprechauns who are depicted as like more, more like Keebler elves than anything else. They kind of, they, they like live in a mushroom. Uh, they play, they play the fiddle and they're doing the, one of them says, what, what is it? I'm walking the, I'm walking the bug, <laughs> walking wa- the bug instead I'm of walking, walking the, the dog. <laughs> <laughs> the sh- oh, the shore beats soul and shoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Maybe not, uh, you know, the picture of the Irish that we want to paint here. But, hey, you know, it's fine? Question mark. I don't know. It, it, it may not be fine. It may not be fine. Uh, uh, the other thing is that Arthur thinks it could be a robot's brain. And we get a cut to a Albert Einstein-like scientist who is trying to play tic-tac-toe with uh one of the coin eating robots from the first season of arthur the episode with the coins and the brownies and uh he looks in the back of the robot's head as it puts like an ice cream cone in its head and he just goes oh no bob's brain is missing I, I love that in Arthur so far, they it seems like they use the same stock uh, illustration of, of a really smart older man, but just mm-hmm. shade him slightly differently depending yeah. on the clip. So this was, I think, the, the tan Einstein, if you will. Hoping, a small part of me was hoping maybe this guy is a little bit Indian, possibly, maybe. But then I remember that the, the hair probably wasn't black enough to warrant that. But just a fun continuity thing there. Perhaps, given the accent, could be German Indian. Ooh, German Indian. I feel like that's a that's gonna be a, a blockbuster film in my in my greatest dreams for <laughs> sure. For sure, I could just see just some South Indian dude going ham on some schnitzel. That sounds amazing <laughs> right now. And this and this person ends up creating artificial intelligence. Yeah, and an artificial intelligence that happens to uh, all be uh, having a brain center that is literally. Uh, I think a, a, a bobbin of all things, right? Yeah. To me, that's just crazy. That that I, I will say, whenever I thought about the yo-yo, I could see myself going there. Whenever I was Arthur's age, mm-hmm. but a robot's brain, a robot's brain, you, <laughs> it's you, yarn. You can't, it's yeah, you, yeah, you can't tell it's thread. Come on, man. So Arthur l- loses track of it, like DW, like he's just kind of fighting over it with DW, and it rolls away. So it goes to each of the friends in turn. The first one it goes to is Brain, who uh, uses it as a wheel, which is the missing part from his uh, airplane. We get a little cutaway here of like Brain saying something like, "You know, I wish I could build this, but my dad's my dad's unfortunately not much help." It goes over to Brain's dad, yeah. who is like taking apart their car, and then looks at a wrench and kind of scratches his head, like, "What is this thing?" Yeah, no, that that part actually made me a little bit frustrated, right? Because okay. it, it's Brain saying, "It's it's Brain," and he's saying, "That's the last time I asked my father for help," right? And if you think about the actual problem. It's that it's it's nothing that his dad could have fixed at all, right? Or or could have even been really blamed for, right? He opens the box, it's missing a wheel. Like, how is that his dad's fault? <laughs> I'm I'm confused. Like, what? Brain just taking the opportunity to dunk on his dad. They are not going to be. Be- <laughs> they may not be best pals when puberty hits old brain. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, so brain does eventually get his plane to take off, but unfortunately he loses the bobbin, which he's using as the wheel. And then unfortunately can't land it without the wheel. We also get a little aside here because Buster is going around to some of the other kids and is asking them for ideas on what to do for his bionic bunny episode. And there was, there's a, there's like a joke here where brain is like, you could do bionic bunny faces a giant duck because he's telling Buster to duck from the airplane. And Buster says something like, no, it was already done in episode like, and the number is something like 2178, which gave me pause because that implies that Bionic Bunny may have over 2,000 episodes. And That still... is a lot of Bionic Bunny, let me tell you. <laughs> and, but, and, but it also kind of justifies the contest of, eh, one of you kids write an episode. We already did 2,000 of them. Something tells me that in a couple of years, Buster's going to be a huge One Piece fan. For sure. <laughs> 2,000 episodes? No problem. <laughs> and he's saying he's halfway done, maybe? 
Oh, strap me in. <laughs> we we have a picture of what type of person Buster is going to be in university. Oh, man. Buster is a One Piece fan. I love it. That fits in so well. <laughs> it seems... So we'll remember uh, yeah, yeah. what I was talking about at the very beginning where um, it, the Arthur universe, these characters have extraordinary abilities and premonition, but, but really bad reaction time in general. That whole sequence is a prime example of that, right? You yeah. see Brain saying duck to Buster a good like seven seconds before he actually has to do anything, right? And he recognizes, okay, instead of maybe diverting this plane slightly, it's just going to come careening straight towards my friend here. Uh, and to me, that was just so funny. That was just so silly. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, no, big time. And uh, the next person it goes to is Francine, who thinks it might be a cat hypnotizer. And she uses it to successfully hypnotize Nemo into, uh, into uh, as she says, water is your friend. You love water. We get a little thing here where Nemo is kind of going from room to room being assaulted by the idea of water. Like, Catherine's drawing a bath, and he doesn't like the sound of it. Mom's doing dishes. He doesn't like the water. Dad's watching surfing on TV, and he faints from the unwanted exposure therapy. Yeah, that cracked me up. I, I'm not gonna lie, that was that was one of the sequences that that actually brought a good legitimate chuckle. Then eventually, Francine does hypnotize Nemo, and it seems to work. But then a bird hijacks the bobbin and ends up taking it over to Muffy, who <laughs> drops on her head, and in classic Muffy verbiage, just says, "Birds are so rude." That very much in line of Muffy, right? But the thought of her, you know retrieving a toy from a, stro- a storm drain and, and giving it a big hug just seems so anti-Muffy to me. I'm sorry, Will. I'm sorry. That's a great – that man, you're, you're, you're bringing some uh, – a fresh vantage point here because you're right. It, it was – this this toy has been in the sewer for goodness knows how long, and she uses the bobbin as a doll rescue rope, which always seemed suspect to me even as a kid because she puts – she makes a loop, and she put. Uh, she uses a slip knot, as she says, which her father taught her, and then slips it around the toy's nose. But the toy looks too big to be lifted up by the string of a bobbin. I don't know. It's bringing physics into a cartoon, so that's I'm I'm already behind before I even start. But uh, <laughs> but that's but that but I like your point a lot better of how she's just immediately hugging Arnie, who is fresh out the sewer. I, I will say I feel like if anything, uh, aside from from the the physics element of of the uh, doll rope scene, I feel like the this kind of of mentality is what tricks people into spending so much money on crane games, right? It's like the same yeah. concept yeah. more than anything else. <laughs> I yeah no I I I I, I kind of get what you're saying there, um, and so Muffy's is the last one. The bobbin ends up rolling away, and and all the kids are kind of looking for it because they want to. Uh, uh, well, they want to claim it as their own. Buster's still walking around trying to think of an idea and a tremendous line here of he comes across a dead leaf and he says, hmm, bionic bunny versus a giant leaf. That hasn't been done before. Probably because it's really dumb. <laughs> and he crushes it. <laughs> so, sav- so savage to himself. I love it. I love it. And the the fact that in, in the next scene, I guess he actually sees the bobbin, right? And, and it all of a sudden gets sucked straight into the conflicting narratives of all the different characters that have come across the bobbin is, is a really fun scene to watch play out as well. Yeah, because they're all making their case for why, for like why it worked for them. And then also taking the air out of everybody else's cases, just like, it's just like, it's not a cat hypnotizer because that's dumb. It's not a doll rescue rope and all this kind of stuff. And Brain is still, like, piloting his airplane in circles because he still can't land it. And as they're fighting about this, Mr. Ratburn comes up on a bicycle in his casual Sunday duds. He's got, like, <laughs> it's the same thing he wore in uh, The Rat Who Came to Dinner, the one where he stayed over at Arthur's place. and oh. uh, But just in, like, his casual duds. It was interesting to see him outside of his normal outfit. And he says, actually, it's a bobbin, and it's mine, because he was using it for a puppet show that he invites them all to go see. And he so he bikes away with the bobbin, and then Brain's uh, plane unfortunately crashes in quite a harrowing moment. It's a, it's a terrific mess of a crash, and they all kind of give the, uh, the taps uh, salute to it as one final goodbye. 
Sometimes in life, tragedy strikes. This, my friends, is one of those moments. Into the salute. I, that, to me, I think that was, the personally, I think the gut buster of the episode for, for me. Uh, that and, the, I think, right before that, where uh, Muffy is saying, it's not a cat hypnotizer, it's a doll rope, and it's mine. And you see Arnie say, I like to share. And Muffy's like, shh. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, great, great stuff. I love, I love the uh, the Arnie voice. It's very. I wonder if it was Arthur Arthur's voice actor because it sounds like just high pitched enough, but close that it could be. It could be an Adventure Time thing where it's maybe the voice actor's little brother. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe they do eventually go to Ratburn's puppet show, which is a puppet show about Elias Howe, who invented the sewing machine, and who is a real person, and. Uh, Mr. Rappard's puppet shows, we've seen them before, but this is really complex because he's not only doing the Marian variation for the, I don't know if that's a word, for the puppets, but the puppets are also like handling a realistic sewing machine and like they have realistic props for it too. And it's quite the sight to see. It's a complex thing. Yeah, really impressive, uh, for sure. I, I think the Rappard's puppetry, you know, that's uh, that's a skill he's maxed out for sure. But but one thing in particular about this scene is 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 right before. Keep in mind that Arthur, you know, at the very beginning of the episode or in the middle, is just like, well, I guess I'm going to go to this puppet show all by myself. And you look at the audience, and it's literally his entire class. I think that Sue Ellen's there, George is there, and of course all of the characters who got invited and who are affected by the Bobbin directly. But I'm just thinking to myself, like. Come on, Arthur. Like, do you just call these couple of people and give up? Or or do you really place all these other folks in your class at such a low tier that you're just thinking to yourself, all right, guess I'm going solo for this one, boys. <laughs> ah, and then so we kind of come to the end of the episode here. Everybody kind of congregates outside of the of the library. Now that the high stakes of the bobbin are taken away, they can all talk about their experiences a little bit more measured. It seems that the cat hypnotizer did indeed work for Nemo. We get a we get a good line here of Buster saying, maybe there's something to be learned from all this. And then a beat, and then everybody goes, nah. I always, <laughs> always appreciate when they kind of buck the idea that all of the episodes have to be about them learning something. And Arthur says, Buster, you're the only one the bobbin didn't help. And Buster says, I wouldn't be too sure about that. And indeed, the episode ends with what we find out is Buster's winning contest entry to Bionic Bunny, where I'll just try and explain as best I can. Bionic Bunny is facing a a gigantic, like a man-sized bobbin, which looks uh, which looks exactly the same, except it has a human nose on the end of it. And apparently it's been hypnotizing cats all over the city into some kind of massive stray cat army. And then a young boy comes up and says, that's a bobbin, Bionic Bunny. Pull its nose before it before it hypnotizes all the cats. And then it wrangles up Bionic Bunny, the bobbin does, and the kid takes off what we find out is a mask, and it's a very diminutive Elias Howe, who is the villain of the episode, who is looking to <laughs> conquer the world with his giant bobbin. This is nuts. This is all over the place. It's ridiculous, for sure. Uh, I, I feel like the Howe family might have been a little bit offended at the end of the day to think that, you know, their their brilliant inventor ancestor is now this supervillain in a Bionic Bunny uh, episode. Yeah. But but I will say, you know, as inventive as that was, I still personally will, and you're, you're, you're welcome to disagree with me on this, I think Arthur was robbed. Giant mechanical guppy, I think, is a way better story than, than, than Bob in for that Bionic Bunny contest. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I, I tend to agree with you. This one is, uh, my last note for it is, it must have been a pretty crummy contest if this is the, <laughs> if this is the entry they went with. Gotta, gotta be real with you. That, that's, just, that's just how I feel. You should have gone with the tried and true. My idea for the Bionic Bunny contest is that Bionic Bunny is in a contest. Duh. 50% yeah. of the time, it works every time. Every time. I mean, 60% of the time. Oh, you know what I just remembered? I don't know if it was a contest, but I remember there was an episode of Dexter's Laboratory where I believe the script was like either completely written or like somewhat written by it might have been one of the kids from that one of the creators of the show or something. I don't know. It, it's uh it's a bit of an oddity. Look it up. I don't have all the information in front of me. I just remember that like um it's also narrated by the same kid. And so it's the little kid trying to do the Dexter voice, 
And it's it's definitely part of it is written like they went along with the little kids writing because a lot of the episode is Dexter saying to Dee Dee, you are stupid. You are stupid, <laughs> which is like a child's understanding of what Dexter's lab is. I mean, you're, you're, you're saying you're saying this description, Will, and all I'm thinking about right now is Axe Cop. I'm yeah. not sure if you're familiar with Axe yeah, Cop. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That is, that is the ultimate version of this. Absolutely. <laughs> fully realized. Fully realized. That's awesome. You know, I was... Dexter's Lab was, was one of those couple of shows that I got a glimpse of whenever I'd, I'd hang out with a friend who happened to have cable and definitely stuck with me. I, I mean... Um, Dexter's Lab was great. Uh, I, I think it was it was by the same guy who made uh, Samurai. Uh, I almost said Champloo, another great anime, but way way <laughs> different. I think I think audience, but Samurai Jack, right? Yes. It's, isn't that all Gendy Tartarovsky? I'm not sure if I butchered that name or not. Yeah, Gendy Tartarovsky, you're right on. Talk about a, a, a visionary for sure. I, I I feel bad because I'm such a big Samurai Jack fan, but I just have not been able to catch up on the most recent uh, season that they released. I, uh, I may, you know, I've made mistakes in my life. And one of them was as a kid deciding that Samurai Jack was too boring and not watching it the rest of the way. I know because, because I, I was a dumb, I was a dumb kid and I didn't know any better because I, because I wanted, you know, I saw, you know, a samurai gets taken to the future and I was like, oh, cool. I bet there's a lot of fighting, but you know, it wasn't as action packed as, I don't know, Beyblade or God knows whatever, wherever I was watching, you know, the stuff that really stood the test of time. So did you I, see how many robots died in that pilot? There were so many robots, man. You're not wrong, but I guess it was too slow for me. Anyway, I'm completely, I was completely wrong. I've, I, I want to watch all of Samurai Jack someday because especially because I've heard so much good stuff about not just the series at large, but also about the final season. Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's really, really good. Um, I know I accidentally name dropped Samurai Champloo as well. I'm sure that was on Adult Swim once upon a time, but yeah, also phenomenal if you enjoy, um, you know, just good works created by really, really good people. Like that was, I think, one that was created by the. Um, it's it's created by Shinjiro Watanabe who made uh, Cowboy Bebop, which yes. I'm not sure if you're a one Bebop of, one, fan or not. One of my all time favorite TV shows. Oh, so good, so mm-hmm. so so good, so <laughs> good. It would be interesting, you know. I, I you know Bebop is one of those shows that's definitely influenced a lot of Western culture. I wonder if there is maybe like one reference to Bebop in an episode of Arthur, like maybe in the background or, or some kind of story that they tell or something. I'll have to keep my eyes peeled. <laughs> we can only hope. Well, from can you see Pal as? Um, Oh, as Ayn? As, as Ayn, yeah. <laughs> you know what? There's got to be some Cowboy Bebop Arthur fan art out there somewhere. And if there isn't, there should be. Okay, so so if okay, you, you have to abide me on this tangent, okay? We've gone down the rabbit hole so far, okay? Uh-huh, uh-huh. It, we're, we're, we're creating the Bebop crew, right? Who plays who, right? If we're saying that Ayn is, is Pal, then yeah. who from the Arthur universe would be, say, Spike, Faye, Jet, Vicious, etc. I feel like this is this is pretty easy, at least for me. Uh, okay. Spike is Buster. Buster is Spike. Uh, Faye is Muffy. Um, Jet is Binky, and uh, Ed is DW. As for Vicious, um, that's tough because there's not really any too there's not too many villainous characters in Arthur. But just just because I like, I might say like Rattles. Rattles, yeah. I was gonna yeah. say if we're if we're going with Buster as as Spike, I think maybe oh, Slink. Was, oh, I was, yeah. I was gonna say, does that make Arthur vicious? Like, does Arthur Ooh. does Arthur do a big time heel turn? You know what? It's it's the universe where Arthur actually did steal those quarters. Oh! That's the universe where this takes place. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Who knew that that one action created Cowboy Bebop? Oh my. Oh my! So then, that that I guess makes makes Francine <laughs> the love interest that they fight for, though that oh, wouldn't be yeah, yeah. canon depending on how Mark Brown wrote Francine, right? True. So maybe true. Sue Ellen would make more sense. Yeah. So yeah. I could I could totally see Sue Ellen as the uh, girl from Tijuana in the first episode as well. Oh yeah, 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 and um, 
and I don't know, Brain would be the guy who gets addicted to drugs or whatever. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> bloody eye. Oh, man. Brain on some bloody eye. That would be crazy. It would help the reaction time a lot, which these characters so desperately need help on. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm not letting that go, Will. I'm sorry. No, don't. Don't let it go. I love it. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Well, from wishing that I was some, wishing that I was different because of how I treated Samurai Jack, uh, we start off the next uh, story, the next Arthur story, which is called Buster's Best Behavior, uh, by Arthur asking if you ever wished you were someone else. Now this is a now this is a weird one. I mean, and 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 trust me, we had some weird ones in the past story there, but this is another level of strange because. Arthur's talking about how, you know, in some situations, maybe you wished you were somebody different, where uh, DW tattles on him for taking the TV. And then we see Arthur in the TV room watching uh, what what we will later find out is Dark Bunny. Uh, and he all of a sudden morphs. He, he changes size and changes appearance to become Grandma Thora. And it and it's accompanied by this noise, and it's like it's like a it's like it's like a record being played in reverse. It's like <laughs> it's I, I, oh, sto- strange. I love it. The the Grandma Thora all Arthur alt costume. That's that's some top tier work right there. I'm, it, I'm, I was one hundred percent about it. You know, we we <laughs> we say the C. It's the C right costume. This is the this is the costume you have to game shark into the game. This is not meant. <laughs> this is not natural. It's not meant to exist. Uh, so yeah, he transforms into Grandma Thor and gets out of getting in trouble. Uh, he is trying to reach an apple in a particularly tall tree, so he just grows several feet and becomes like uh, Hakeem Olajuwon or something. <laughs> And I don't think his shoe size changes during that sequence either. Like in the Grandma Thora <laughs> one, you can see his shoes get a little bit wider. Yeah. But his shoes literally stay exactly the same. So you have like this spaghettified Arthur just reaching for that apple. It's perfect. With so these, good. With these dainty little boy feet. <laughs> and then finally, it's like, if, or maybe you wish you were, so, but, uh, you were more talented at something. He's practicing the piano, making a couple of mistakes. So then he just wills himself to grow... Uh, what looks to be like a shaggy gray hair, and I'm gonna mess this up. I'm sure this isn't what it is, but like a like a cummerbund, or a, like basically he transforms himself into Beethoven, into oh, like man, the stereotypical was... image of Ludwig von Beethoven, and then plays the piano beautifully. Yeah, and I and, and you know I I. I saw that it was Beethoven. I tried to, to be a good guest and bring some extra knowledge to figure out what it is that he plays. And I asked a couple of my friends who, who played a lot of uh, piano. And the consensus was that it's not anything that was composed by Beethoven necessarily. It's just some, a short blurb that was created for TV, basically. So you... it would have been cool to see Arthur go ham on some Moonlight Sonata or something like that. I'm not sure if that's still Beethoven, actually. It, it I is... myself did not personally play piano but. it's it's my favorite beethoven actually uh but i must commend you for doing research where i could not be bothered to <laughs> year, two years into this podcast see that's the thing right you have so much clout as like a definitive voice in the arthur game right and, oh, and for, i'm like the oh, young mc sakes. trying to get some skin in the game here right <laughs> it's, it's it's one of those moments it's like that that video of um that the one guy rapping in front of kanye west begging him to sign him i feel like that guy right now will you're really showing me up here. And <laughs> not only that, but also uh you're you know, the definitive voice in the Arthur game. My, like what does that even mean? What does that look like? I don't know. I think All we- I'm saying is one day I was looking up new episodes of Dissect the Music Podcast and I happened to stumble upon a group of folks who happened to dissect every episode of Arthur, right? And to my knowledge, there's nobody else doing it. So that puts y'all uh, pretty high up there, I'd say, in, 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 the, in the Arthur realm. And that, the Arthurverse, is that what you call it? I, you call it the Arthurverse? I, don't, I don't call it anything <laughs> at this point. Let's say, Ar- <laughs> let's, let's say Arthurverse or maybe Mark Browniverse. We'll have to figure it out later. We'll have to workshop that. Uh, Ooh, would it actually be the Thoraverse? Because I, I know that a lot of these stories that Mark Brown wrote were inspired by his grandma Thora. So see, you're, key, oh, is she the puppet master? Man, dude, you're coming at the king and you're not missing here. This is <laughs> you're showing me up. I did, I genuinely didn't know that. Yeah, I mean it makes sense too, right? Liquid, I'm pretty sure is based off of Erie, which I'm sure y'all have talked about before um, on the podcast. It's like the town that he grew up in. 
And yeah. I know that the episodes were, um, or the, the stories were all stories that his grandma told him, I think. And she like instilled into him a penchant for telling stories. So that's why we have Arthur. Go figure. Yeah, we yeah, <clears throat> totally talked about that before. <laughs> See, see, this is why I, this is why it's good to have you on the show because now you can't go off and make your own Splinter Arthur podcast. Now you're in our collective. You're in our cabal of Arthur experts. I don't know. I might be coming through with a bobbin hypnotizing Arthur fans. Now I can take over the Arthur universe, right? Wow. I'll be the new Elias Hound. Don't worry about it. He's young, El- about young it. Elias Howe over here. Lil, I guess for, if it's 2018, Lil Elias Howe. Oh, look for my mixtape. It's going to be 18, 18 tracks of garbage all on SoundCloud. <laughs> it's going to be great. The oh. the only inventor flexor in the game. It's going to be nice. <laughs> Uh, so Arthur talking about all the ways that you could potentially change yourself, but one person he admires is somebody who never is anybody but himself. And it's a similar to re- reveal to the episode where Buster was really mad at Binky, where it's like he's behind kind of a curtain and Arthur pulls a string and reveals Buster. And instead of Buster being himself, he's decked out with like sunglasses. His ears are kind of folded together to represent like a greaser hairstyle and he's got a leather jacket on and he looks at Arthur and this delivery is unforgettable after you hear it once he looks at Arthur and he says yo Audie man (laughs) man that cracked me up I I just feel bad for Arthur at this point as as a storyteller because he's he's all he's caught in these situations where he's just like setting up Buster for so much success and being like my best friend in the world he would never change Buster and and two for two being let down there in Dang. like the, in like the exact same situation too. It's pretty embarrassing. Um, so this starts with the Arthur and Buster getting picked for a uh, soccer game. Buster gets picked second last, which is seen as a great boon by his team. Everybody's like, "Yeah, pick Buster." And then poor Arthur gets picked last. Binky just kind of goes. Okay, then we pick Arthur, and Arthur tries to go in there enthusiastic, but nobody cares. Uh, I just want to say, that Will, before. really quickly, before before we talk go any further, yeah. can we talk about how mismatched these teams are, right? Mm-hmm. Especially in the context of soccer. So I'm I'm much like you, I'm not much of a sports fan. Um, but but I, I, I know enough to be dangerous from time to time, right? So if you take a game like basketball, right, that's yes. a strong link sport in the sense that um, how well a team does is typically determined by how good their strongest player or players are, right? Yeah. Um, so case in point, the Cleveland Cavaliers, right? Um, LeBron James is just such a god-tier player, and literally everybody else on his team is garbage. But because basketball is a strong link sport, he can consistently get them to the finals, right? Now, you contrast that with a, a sport like soccer, which is a weak link sport, right? Where how well you do is actually determined by your worst player, right? And it's not a sport where you could have one star player that all of a sudden can just magically carry you through all these games. Um, case in point, Ronaldo, right, at the World Cup most recently, had an incredible, incredible, one of the, one of the most beautiful PKs I've ever seen, right? One of the most beautiful free kicks I've ever seen. But his team does not make it past, I think, the round of 16, maybe the round of eight, right? Mm. So that preamble aside, you jump into this team, and, and I'm talk, looking at Binky's team. These people are stacked, right? You have Binky, who in the season before, they were talking about with Francine about how Binky is, is, should be able to make the travel team this year, no problem. You have the Brain, who in, in previous episodes, and definitely in some future episodes, is shown to go toe-to-toe with Francine uh, in a lot of athletic events, right? Yeah. Um, and you have yeah. Jenna, who literally plays select soccer all on a team, as well as Arthur, right? So that, to me, that, that should be the Golden State Warriors right there, right? Except in, in soccer form, right? I mean, it's such a dominant team. And then on Francine's team, you have Francine, um, you have um, Rabbit Kid. I don't even know what to call him. Uh, uh, we, we, we Watership call, Down? We Watership call him, Down? We call him Frank. We call him Frank. Frank. Okay, you, you got Frank. Um, you have George. and No, no, no. You have Muffy and Buster. Right. And to me, I'm just thinking to myself, there's no way if you really look at like like how good each of the characters are in certain sports that that Francine's team should even have a chance. 
And you see this sequence of them just bodying, absolutely <laughs> bodying Binky's team. Like Francine, literally, I'm sure Francine probably has scoliosis in, in, in the Jump Forward episodes, or if there's an Arthur grown up because of how hard she was carrying that team. It's ridiculous. Okay, a couple things here. First of all, this is exactly the kind of commentary and insight that I would expect <laughs> from someone at your level, JV. Second of all, that was fascinating to sit under the learning tree of just like I, I under, I, I'm like, like we've talked about, not much of a sports guy. Also, talking in the wrong end of my mic, and uh, but. <laughs> I, yeah, I totally get what you're saying, and that makes a lot of sense. And, man, oh, man, we got to it, – it's going to be tough schedule-wise, but we got to get uh, you and Lucas on the same show because I feel like he would be – if he, when he listens to this episode, he's going to be all in for the talk about basketball. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That like was... I said, I only know enough to be dangerous, right? I'm sure me and Lucas could probably go on a lot more diatribes on hip-hop in particular – uh, but I think it'd be a good time. I think it'd be a good time. I would love it. Hopefully, we can make that happen someday. Francine's team, who Buster, who Buster was on or Buster was with, uh, end up winning the soccer game. It's just a little bit of like a minute of uninterrupted soccer. And the theme here for the first part of the episode is that Arthur is very congratulatory and uh, ad in admiration of Buster, who's his best friend. He's like, man, you guys played great. And Buster's like, well, it's actually Francine who did all the uh, who did all the work. He's kind of downplaying his own involvement. Uh, we get a cut to the school band, the band room where all the kids are playing their instruments. And uh, uh, like Binky's doing a bit of improv. Sue Ellen's doing a bit of improv. And then Buster comes in with shave and a haircut. And Arthur, very easily amused, busts a gut at shave and a haircut. Uh, which he thinks is really funny, but Buster plays it off of just like, nah, Binky and Sue Ellen, they're the ones who are really good. And the last thing is that they have a project for Mr. Ratburn's class about uh, um, uh, like the underwater food chain or something like that, and Buster's uh, pro uh, project is a picture of a shark eating a license plate, whereas he sees like, you know, the brain has created this awesome like mechanical demonstration of how a fish's food chain works. Arthur's really impressed by Buster Shark, but he just says, that's ah, just a dumb drawing. Like when he sees every what the work everybody else has done. So he's really down on himself. And we and th that kind of leads into the theme of the episode. Buster has a really relatable problem here that he's talking to with his mom uh, about feeling like he's not the best at anything. Like th he doesn't have a thing, which is something that I still kind of battle with to this day of all of all the mental problems that I've admitted on this show. One of them is just like feeling like I don't have a particular speciality, whereas I see a lot of people with it. Anyway, that's that's kind of one of the main driving forces of the motivation for Buster in this episode. Well, I got to ask, did your mom comfort you by saying that you're the best at being her sweet, cuddly little boy? Uh, yes, probably something to that degree. And I, I feel like I've also come to to Jenna, my fiance, with this before. And she hasn't <laughs> called called me her cuddly little boy, but has definitely said like you're the best at being the cutest. And I'm like, thanks. <laughs> you know? Oh man, I, I will say that um, even though this is you know very clearly geared towards kids, you know there there are definitely those those moments when I was watching this episode and I was like, sometimes it do be like that though. <laughs> it's just, it really does I, I feel like it's such a relatable thing that that um especially um when i talk to adults these days right you, you talk about like uh, a midlife crisis um and i feel like as the generations go on it, it's not just the midlife crisis in the 40s but the mid-20s crisis and the mid-30s crisis etc that people go through and i feel like it's all really common sentiments and could this be like one of the early arthur episodes that's talking about depression perhaps dude my life is a crisis <laughs> uh well i've lucas and i have always said that the best arthur episodes are the ones that are still relatable uh no matter what age you're at and i don't know if they've necessarily tackled uh you know this subject necessarily but there have been past episodes where it's like wow this really hit close to home and in a way in a way that's completely different from how we viewed it as kids and this is uh no different. This is very much the same way. Uh, I But I also got a nitpick a bit here. When Buster and his mom, Bitsy, are having dinner, we see a shot of their dinner plate. And I don't know whose idea it was to put a bun, the bun of the meal, right in the middle of the plate. 
But that's a Ooh. that's a party foul, B. You know what, Bitsy? Bless her. You know, she's a great reporter, I'm sure. Not the best at plating, right? This is one of those those moments where I think she'd be she'd be chopped immediately if she was on any sort of Food Network show. Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. But meanwhile, Arthur is still, you know, very very much he looks up to Buster in a way. He thinks he's really funny. He's like when he's talking to his family, he's still talking about how great shave and a haircut is, which man, once he, uh, once he hears like comedy rap, he's going to lose. He's once he hears the lonely Island, he's going to, he's going to lose it. DW hears him talking about Buster so much of this, like uh, again, calling him bumpster, but of just like, this guy sounds great. How about he lives over here and Arthur uh, goes away forever or something like that <laughs> to which mom and dad are horrified. And DW says, I just want everyone to be happy. Am I the only one with family values? Such a beautiful scene. Yeah. Uh, and I love the continuity there of DW consistently mispronouncing any of Arthur's friends' names. <laughs> I, I, I try to listen again to see if she would call Buster Bumpster again in the episode, but I think that this is the only time that, that she does. I think the other time she just refers to him as that kid. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty funny. Yeah, and the and so this is an Arthur Buster episode because Arthur's dueling uh, motivation with Buster is that he wants to be more like Buster because every because it seems like everybody loves him, everybody really likes Buster, and Arthur just wants to be loved. And I was like, oh man, this is getting way too close to home. Talk talk about me relating to Arthur, just like man, we we become more and more one every single day. I'm starting to think maybe Arthur. Arthur maybe influenced my life more than I'm willing to admit. And this, it kind of seems strange to me that Buster didn't realize that he is the funny guy. Yeah, and not just the funny guy, but the food guy as well, right? Yeah, he's like two things. I mean, I mean, maybe it's a case where he's still kind of wallowing in the defeat uh, to Camp Meadowcroak in that pie eating contest in, in the in the Renaissance oh, Fair episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To um, uh, Glenbrook. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, to Glenbrook. Yeah, and maybe that's what it is. But there's literally a sequence I think, um, in, in maybe in season six where Buster enters a. a a pizza eating contest and people are like oh man here comes the ringer because you see this man literally eat an entire pizza in one bite right how can you look at those skills at that skill set and be like i'm just not really good at anything i don't know yeah well that's uh, i mean to your point about depression sometimes that's that's what it can do it just takes away your uh your uh, vision of yourself but that's maybe reading a bit too much into it so they're both uh, Buster is determined to find something that he can be the best at, even though we already kind of have two things that he is the best at, so I don't know. Uh, he tries to be, like, the sports guy uh, by kind of emulating Francine. He tries to, like, kick a soccer ball X amount of times in the air and, like, gets to maybe two and hits himself in the head and doesn't want to be the sports guy anymore. Uh, I do 500 every single day to warm up. Oh, me too. One funk. <laughs> Whack. Uh, Arthur, Arthur's enlisting the help of Brain to uh, figure out what it is that makes everybody love Buster. And Brain uses a simple mathematic formula that between Arthur and Buster, there is a difference, which he names element X. And he's trying to communicate to Arthur that they don't know what the difference is. And Brain says discovering that could take years and millions of dollars in research. Maybe millions of dollars in, in calculator money that Brain dropped on that TI Infinity or whatever? Like, how did, what, what buttons does he push to make it so that it's an aardvark and a rabbit on the, uh, on the display of, of this calculator equaling yeah. X, right? Like, that's got to be some advanced, like, if there's even a way to jailbreak a calculator, like, I, I couldn't even believe that sequence. Yeah, it's like we're barely able to write boobs on a calculator, but he's able to get <laughs> a whole man on there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I put, I put his human calculator here, too. Arthur is trying to find out what the difference is between him and Buster, and which eventually leads him to where he comes back. Uh, Buster's still trying to be the sports guy, so he tries to kind of take on the Francine role in a soccer game, but basically ends up, keep, keeps running into Francine, and screwing her up so that they end up losing the game, apparently big time, and just kind of gets in her way. So he decides he doesn't want to be the sports guy. 
I, I, I'm going to say, Will, there's this one particular part in this sequence, right, where they're both saying, I got it, yeah. right? And they go for the header, and Buster happens to hit it first. It bounces off of Francine's head yeah, and gets into the goal. And, say, and Francine's like, Buster, you scored on your own team. I'm just going to go ahead and make the subreddit now. Buster did nothing wrong, all right? <laughs> Clearly, that was Francine's fault for poor positioning more than anything else. Like, think about what had to happen for Buster to head it and for it to ricochet off of Francine. Like, that means that Francine probably was nowhere near the ball in the first place unless she has, like the mega leaps, right? And she has a, 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 all of a sudden amassed the ability to teleport. Like, I'm just saying, I, Buster I, did nothing wrong. I noticed that as a kid too, and it bugged me. And I think it's more of just like Francine trying to save her own pride by just throwing Buster under the bus. It just seems like something that she would do so that it wasn't her fault somehow, even though it kind of was. Uh, so Buster thinks he sees Muffy uh, showing off a new uh, dress of hers, a new skirt, and like on ensemble as she says and buster's like maybe i could be the fashion guy so he ends up modeling like uh to the tough customers as we find out that's kind of the the revealed joke of him being like my shirt is an original tee and my jeans with the grass stains complete the ensemble and then it just goes to binky and i love this he's just like so what just you know so, how you so flip offended. his uh his reaction from so what uh to something where he's he's totally on board yeah and it, it's Buster's key mistake is that he didn't slap a Supreme symbol on there, right? Ooh, That's ooh. all you have to do for male fashion. Just slap a Supreme symbol on, on anything, and it works. That's how you go from so what to what what? Yes. Exactly. That's the that, <laughs> that's the whitest thing I've ever said, ladies and gentlemen. Very much so. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna let it slide this time around. Though. Ah. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I I will say though, right? Yeah. If if we had to have a conversation on on how Buster would dress in the future, what are we what are we looking at? Right? Are, are we? I guess are, are we're more akin to like maybe Jughead and Riverdale as like a Buster outfit, or. Yeah. What are we looking at? Yeah. Um. Well, we've seen we've seen the flash forwards in even in, as we've brought it before the contest episode. He's kind of like got the jeans. He's got like a bomber jacket kind of thing going on. So that seems to be his his style. You know, kind of kind of keeping it casual, but also uh, kind of a retro cool almost with a bomber jacket. I'm just saying, maybe Buster just uh, has to has to have a couple lessons on the color wheel, right? Mm. Then he could have some fresh threads, you know, make it really rock at Lakewood. I'm just saying. Now, I'm the literally the worst person to consult about this, and I'm not sure, Will, if 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 you can relate to this or not. Yeah. But I feel like being with my wife is the only reason why I can dress like an adult. Uh, no, I I I don't. I still don't dress like an adult. Uh. <laughs> Uh, my entire closet is wrestling shirts and shorts, so I dress exactly like how you would expect a wrestling fan to dress. Uh, no, sometimes I can clean up okay, but that is almost entirely. And and to your point, uh, due to my fiance just being like, "Wear this because I'm wearing this dress," and I'm like, "You got it." I could not care less about what I wear. Yeah, there's definitely been a couple of occasions where I've 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 you know shown an outfit and I've asked my wife, you know, like what do you think about this outfit? And she's like, yeah, I mean, it looks good if you want to look like a watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> Savage. The honesty that you can only get from the people truly close to you. Uh, we, we, get, we get a couple more Buster interludes here. Uh, he thinks maybe he can be the smart guy, but he uh, Brain asks him to confirm a theory about black holes, and Buster immediately, like, his eyes go wide, and he just screams because he is so out of his depth. I love that sequence uh, so much. Just uh, oh, and, and I feel like there had to have been maybe like another instance of of Buster like pretending to be smart or or, or, or posing to be smart. I, I just can't remember off the top of my head. It's definitely him like uh, mimicking brains, like hand on the chin sort of thing. He's yeah, just just, tr- just trying to like be smart by association, but it completely failing. Uh, we also tr- get him trying to fit in with the tough customers, and we catch Binky and, and uh, Rattles in the middle of a growling contest where they're, they're just kind of snarling at each other. And then Buster comes in and tries to outgrowl Binky, but then Binky just does one, and Buster just runs away frightened. <laughs> I loved it. I, 
<laughs> Man, and intimidation definitely not high. I think uh, if if we're looking at uh, character traits for for Buster, not not his strong suit. Probably uh, much better if he if he sticks with charisma more than anything else there. Mm-hmm. So. Uh... Buster, everybody notes that Buster has been acting weird lately, so they try and find Arthur, who may have the answers, and they're, uh, but they're, they haven't seen him all day. So they, of course, go to track him down in the library. There's a couple of gags of, like, looking behind people's books. And then they finally find him, and he has two carrots with him that he's eating. And he even makes a joke here of, my definition of a well-balanced meal is a carrot in each hand. And you can kind of glean here that Arthur is trying to emulate Buster uh, in order to emulate the same love that people have for him. In fact, Muffy says, I think we found Buster. Um, and I love how immediately and clearly how lame Arthur is when he's trying to do the bus- the Buster shtick, when he's trying to stray outside of his lane. And it's just like when Arthur tries to be the funny guy, it's horrible. It's already been proven. I'm pretty sure this happened last season or maybe the season before where Buster, where, where Arthur tries telling a joke in the cold open and butchers it entirely. Like how many times does this kid have to learn his lesson that, you know, that style of clowning isn't for him? I'm sorry. Well, it's there was an, there was an entire episode called Arthur the Unfunny. So... I mean, you know, people think they can be comedians just because they can, you know, get a couple of a couple of hearts and maybe a retweet on Twitter. But Arthur's just not meant to be a comedian. He's got to leave it Man, to the pros. I think that maybe Arthur in an alternate universe is Joel Maisel from Marvelous Miss Maisel. Possibly. I'm not sure if you're you're up to date on, I, on your Amazon I, Prime. I am not. I'm sorry. Oh, OK. OK. Do me a favor. I have a feeling that that you and and your fiance are going to really enjoy it. Marvelous Miss Maisel, great show. But the pilot, um, the, the the main character, her husband is is trying to strike it out as a comedian, and he's just basically taking jokes that he's heard and delivering them much worse than the actual comedians who came up with them, right? So I could totally see Arthur kind of in this sequence doing more or less the same, right? Where mm. he's just taking jokes that he's taking in from like a joke book and then just giving, you know less than buster standards of delivery on said jokes so mm-hmm. uh and then we finally get to buster's revelation of that if he's trying if he's trying to find his thing he should be like somebody he admires and the people he names are arthur and abraham lincoln we even get like a little cutaway of uh buster as abraham lincoln to which he says it would probably take me years to grow a beard but i can be like <laughs> arthur <laughs> So that it's, illustration is so perfect too of Abraham Lincoln as Buster. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 real good. Um, and I I just find it very telling of just like yeah, Arthur and Buster really are good friends. They think of each other first, and then right behind Arthur is you know one of the greatest presidents of all time. You know, depending on who you ask. But uh, that's that's high company. Yeah, that's that's quite the short list too, right? Yeah, like, when you really think about it, it's just like it's like it's like, oh, what do you want for Christmas? Oh, you know, a million dollars or, you know, a, a new pair of underwear like <laughs> it's like two totally clashing ideals uh, <laughs> Not even in the same category. And then finally, these two conflicting visions come together of Arthur as Buster and Buster as Arthur uh, in the Sugar Bowl with Brain, Francine and Muffy. Uh, Arthur's trying to tell more jokes. They're like they're really bad. He's just basically reading from a joke book and has no presence, no real good delivery. Buster is now taking the Arthur role in that he's just kind of talking about Arthur's mundane life of just like, you know, DW really is a like an annoying little sister. And I felt that Buster's take on Arthur kind of seemed like he was like a proto vlogger. Like he's just kind of talking about stuff in his life. I, I felt don't... like it was if if you I guess it was it was so close to being just like an outright roast of Arthur. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except there's no real punchlines. It just sounds a little I, I don't want to go so far as to say pathetic because I, you know, compare, compared to a, blo- a vlogger, but it's like, it's so mundane and like, who could care? But when, but I guess Arthur has a way of spinning it that uh, maybe it's because it's his show, you know, a way of making it a little more interesting. But Buster just kind of can't handle the, uh, the, um, the, not the drudgery. What's the word I'm looking for? The mundanity of real life. He's, he's the comedian and Arthur's the normal guy and they never, the twain should meet. 
<laughs> there's two parts in this Sugar Bowl sequence that, that crack me up, right? Uh, that I kind of want to highlight. The first, again, Arthur, the, the folks in the Arthurverse having elastic bodies. When, when Brain's jaw drops, you hear the elastic oh, noise again. Oh, yeah, yeah, similar yeah. to the uh, cat in my head noise. And Fra I think it's either Francine or Muffy that pops it back into place. But the second part is actually when they go outside of the Sugar Bowl and they're peering inside and Muffy's saying, I can't tell which one is which because they're both wearing the exact same outfit. Mm -hmm. And and Francine very condescendingly is like, Muffy, Buster's the one with the ears. Now, the reason why this is important, Will, is if you go back to the library sequence when they're looking for Arthur and they're just looking at people <laughs> behind books, there's a very clear sequence, I think, of Francine in particular, looking at what appears to be their gray tabby cat or a hair of some sorts and just peeking to make sure it's not Arthur. Like, really? You can't clown on Muffy when, like, 15 minutes before that, you're looking at somebody who has who matches the profile of Arthur to the negative degree, right? Like, it doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense. Yeah, I agree with you. So at this point, they're trying to figure out exactly, like, why this is happening. Uh, Arthur and Buster try to try to talk to each other in their new personas, but it's completely lost on the other one. Like, uh... Arthur says, like, Buster's just boring now. He just complains about DW. Who wants to hear somebody complain about DW all the time? And uh, Buster's saying, like, Arthur's just not funny anymore. Or, or like, Ar I forget what he says about Arthur, but it's just Arthur's like... Arthur's just kind of boring. Kind of boring, he's just, yeah. Yeah. Because he's, he's, he's doing all the jokes that Buster's already heard before. There's a little bit longer of Brain, Francine, and Muffy trying to figure this out. There's a great line from Brain as they're in school, just like, I did a lot of research last night and discovered something. This isn't in any books. It's like, <laughs> it's like, just, like, just like that vine of that guy going to feed the birds and just like, hey, guys, I have nothing. I have nothing. Do you want nothing? I, do you want nothing? I have nothing. Um, and, so the, and so Arthur and Buster don't even like talk to each other anymore because of their new persona. And the, basically the climax of the episode is uh, Francine trying to get them back together by getting them to play soccer. And then, you know, Arthur says, you know, I'm pretty hungry. And Buster's like, I have to feed pal. And then Francine just gets mad and just like, I can't take this anymore. In fact, she gets so mad she breaks the fourth wall. She goes, we like Arthur as Arthur and Buster as Buster. And then she looks directly into the camera and says, and so do you. Oh, man, that that was such a great meta moment, especially when you kind of couple that with the the meta moment before where where Arthur is talking and, and kind of venting to brain about his issues with Buster right now. And he's saying, who'd want to hear someone all day, you know, nag about DW, right? And yeah. that's totally what we do whenever we tune into to Arthur fairly consistently, right? Mm -hmm. so, but yeah, great scene there for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah, like I, I mean, it's it's wonderful because I I know that right before then it's it's the brain that's trying to get into some very long winded explanation uh, with with element X, uh, and Francie is just like forget element X and she just lays it straight and I love it. That's like some high tier Francine action right there. Well, I mean, saying. I mean, it really is just like it, it, like you said, her taking action of this of just like enough of this, no more overcomplicating it, no more overthinking. We like you the way you are. And we and we get a little bit of a reveal to Arthur and to Buster of just Buster saying, I was just trying to be like somebody I admired. And Arthur being like, yeah, me too. Uh, kind of realizing that they, I get sort, sort of realizing that they don't need to change to be, you know, the best version of who they want to be, I guess. it's. I'll, I'll be honest with you, like the episode pretty much ends after this and Francine like going like, that's more like it as they're back to their original roles. Kind of... This will factor into my overall feelings in the episode, but it's just like I didn't feel like this was even much of a conclusion. They just kind of decide not to that they that they don't have this problem anymore, kind of thing. There was an interesting continuity error as well in that last sequence. Yes, I know. Because, I know what you mean. Yeah. So so when it when you cut to Buster now with the joke book in hand, which Francine, if you, if you if you go back to the to the scene before, Francine, it's like Arthur, give me that joke book, and she takes the joke book from Arthur and gives it to Buster's hands. So it's good to see that continuity continued. Wow, that's not even a sentence. But I digress. Uh, there's this part where you, you're seeing Buster, and he's reading out of the joke books and telling a joke to Arthur, and he's wearing his standard Buster attire in the blue. Mm -hmm. But then whenever it pans back and you see both of them in frame, Buster's still wearing his Arthur alternative costume. It's like, Whoa! I never noticed that as a kid. 
I definitely did, but I uh, didn't want to note it here. Uh, but I'm glad that I'm glad that you did. I was just kind of like, this is at the end of the episode. And I'm like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> see, <laughs> see, see what I mean? Uh, g- two years of podcasting breeds laziness, or at least it does in me. But uh, that's why that's why we need young bloods like you to uh, <laughs> to liven up the game here. Yeah, it's a fresh pair of eyes. That's all. That's it. We both we both are bespectacled. Gla- uh, Arthur and I. That is mm-hmm. right. I think that that's one of the things that I related to Arthur with as well was just that ability to not really see anything until I got glasses in the uh, in the second grade. So, go figure. Go figure. And that brings us to the end of this episode. And as we normally do at the end, uh, we talk about the two stories we've seen and uh, our feelings on them. So let's go back to what is that thing. JV, uh, what did you make of what is that thing? I enjoyed it. Um, I thought that the the last part when they're saying maybe there's a lesson to be learned from this and they just say, nah, is a really good telling of, of the episode as a whole, right? It doesn't really stick itself out to be something that um, necessarily uh, develops the characters to a drastic degree or is even that emotionally heavy. It's just a really light episode that I think is just a lot of fun to watch. And just as a one-off, it did a really, really good job. Um, it's permanently ingrained what the word bobbin is in my mind. Um, so for those reasons, I, I, I enjoyed it. You know, it's it's not going to be heralded, I think, as, as you know, one of the greatest episodes of the show, let alone the season. Um, but I think it was a lot of fun, um, it, the, you know, starting with that Final Destination-esque scene of the bobbin transversing throughout uh, Elwood City and finally landing on, on uh, right next to Brain. Like, it, it was just cool and just, uh, just a lot of fun to watch as a whole. Um, I, yeah, it's definitely the, it works because it markets itself. It puts itself forward as just like, ah, it's just meant to be fun. Don't take it too seriously. And you know, the ensemble episodes I feel are pretty hit or miss for us. This one, uh, maybe is neither hit nor miss for me. I, I think there's, you know, some fun elements. It keeps it very kinetic, uh, in terms of just the action moving forward. Uh, it's not exactly consequential, which, you know, I, Kind of was talking about before, but uh, at the same time, it's you know it's a pretty easy it's a pretty easy ten minutes, so uh, it's it's hard to not recommend, especially if you have any nostalgia for it like we do. Um, and some of the visuals are pretty fun too, of just like the different ways to use a bobbin, which you probably never thought of before. Uh, Buster's best behavior. Now, I kind of like parts of this more than I like the whole. Um, I, I, I appreciate the idea in play here, especially on Buster's side of just like, and, and Arthur's as well, of like trying to be like somebody you admire and trying to find your place in like a friend group and just in the world in general. It's a tough question and one that even as an adult you have a hard time answering. Um, and, I, and I liked the comedic uh, attempts of Buster to try it. Like I thought there were parts of this that were pretty funny and uh, pretty charming, mostly from Buster's point of view. And I did like how like, awful of a comedian arthur is it's it's just that's that's an an aspect of arthur failing i don't mind seeing because it just is consistently very funny but i think what really falters for me is the the wrap-up of the episode because they just kind of decide to not have these problems anymore like francine basically unilaterally solves it for them and then they just kind of go back to not thinking about it and i felt like we didn't really get anywhere which of course Arthur's a pretty serialized, serialized show, so, or rather, maybe episodic is the word I'm looking for. Um, so it's not going to be, you know, like lasting change among the characters or something. But I felt like it was kind of an easy get out of get out of message free card that uh, I felt kind of made it seem inconsequential the rest of the episode. So it was all right. I just felt like there were aspects of the more serious part of the story that could have been done a bit better. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you there, Will, for sure. Um, the elements that were done well, I think were, were done pretty well. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed the cold open, for instance, just because of how odd it was and, and, and the little, uh, you know, call-outs to, to Beethoven, etc. cetera. Um, but, I, but I will say that one thing that, that I thought was really interesting was the pairing of the two episodes, right? Um, I think that the, the first episode, right, it, it's all about, it's kind of talking about how, Something could be many different things, right? Finding multiple uses for one particular thing. And and the second episode paired with that is really interesting because it, it almost conveys like this theme of like 
being comfortable with who you are, right? And not trying to be something that you're, that you're not more than anything else. Um, so it, to me, it was like really interesting just from a pairing perspective. I think that the episodes went well together in, in, the, in that really interesting overarching thing. And, I, and I'm sure that maybe, uh, you know, like Arthur, I can't necessarily grow. So I'm, I'm reaching a bit. Uh, but 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 I, I thought that it was a really interesting pairing for sure between the two episodes. Um, overall, definitely a very rushed conclusion. Um, but there was just a couple of parts there that just felt like very very relatable. Uh, maybe not necessarily as relatable to kids right away, but but I think for for some adults they'd be surprised at how relatable, especially the front the front half of the episode is. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, man, it's this has been one of our longer episodes in a while. I'm I'm happy to say because we uh, we we uh, we had quite a few things to say about this, and uh, of course your insight was appreciated, JV. So before we get into all the plugs here and end off the episode, uh, I'd like t- uh, for you to just take a second and let everybody know where they can find you and uh, what you are up to uh, online these days that people can check out. Uh, absolutely. Um, you can find me on Twitter at jvarg1990, uh, or hit me up on my website, uh, hirejv.com. Uh, right now I'm working on fleshing out my calendar for the rest of the year, as well as early 2019 in regards to, um, esports events, as well as some conferences. So, uh, if you have any, uh, particular events that you think you'd like me to be a part of, um, feel free to reach out in either one of those methods. All right, and of course, with and when it comes to Elwood City Limits, uh, I will I will throw this out here for, uh, of course, your friend and mine that couldn't be that couldn't be with us tonight. I do hope that we'd be able to get the three of us on a future episode. I'm kind of looking at the I'm eyeing that best of the nest episode. Uh, so I'm going to see, I'm going to see about a thing or two with that. Uh, of course you can follow Lucas Mancini, my regular co-host at Lucas underscore Mancini on Twitter. Speaking of Twitter, we are on there as well. Let me tell you the social links for ECL, uh, on Twitter at ECL podcast. Uh, we are on Facebook, facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits on Tumblr. Uh, elwoodcitylimits.tumblr.com we will be doing emails on the next episode I promise thank you to Anna who sent in an email and we will be reading it next time and also congratulations uh, elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com finally you can find the podcast on Apple Podcasts and the Google Play Store and of course at elwoodcitylimits.libsyn.com well JV this has been a really fun uh, couple of hours here and I want to thank you very much for taking the time to, to read out my goodness we might have never even had this great interaction if uh you hadn't said something so i'm really glad that we, you and i were able to uh, kind of get together on this yeah i appreciate you will for letting me slide into the dms there and uh you know kick off this conversation honestly i just wanted to talk about woke talk with uh, some some really in tune arthur folks about arthur so to actually come onto the show has been definitely a blast and uh it would be really cool to be able to do it again with lucas as well I I'm going to I'm going to go so far as to say you haven't heard the last of JV in an Elwood <laughs> City Limits uh capacity. So uh if you guys if you guys liked hearing him, he, I do believe he will be back sooner rather than later. Add him to the roster of uh ECL guests out there. And coming up next uh, next time. I keep saying next week, but you never know. It could be an off week. I hope not because I want to get to this episode sooner rather than later. And I'm just confirming here so that I can definitively say that, yes, this is the last episode of season four. And this I can't I can't wait to talk about this one. It's my music rules. And that's a baby show. Oh, I I am really excited to see y'all's take on 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 both of those episodes, Um, especially that's a baby show, because, you know, without diving too much into it i felt like i i related so much as a high schooler continuing to watch arthur you know uh i think well past the uh, targeted demographic there yes and i will be getting into that myself that's a baby show uh one of my most well-remembered arthur episodes we'll see if it's still one of my favorites and my music rules that is uh these are these are both all timers at least they have the capacity to be and i hope that they live up to the hype so that's coming up next time on elwood city limits also by now or actually um 
if this is yeah, I'm planning this to come out on either Friday or Saturday by the weekend. Coming up in a couple of days on Sunday, it came out for our uh, Patreon patrons. I still don't know what to call them. Over at Elwood at patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits, uh, they got a week's early access to our full commentary of Arthur It's Only Rock and Roll. Yes, it's the episode with the Backstreet Boys. The the hour long special with the Backstreet Boys, and that is going to be available to you this Sunday. And I'll tell you this, the best news is it's absolutely free. It's uh, We managed to get it up on Bandcamp this time. It is a pay-what-you-want. Do not feel obligated to pay anything at all. We just wanted to put it there in case you wanted to pay something. But if you don't want to, $0 is A-OK with us. We just want you to hear it. We had a Lucas and I had a blast recording this commentary, and it's a really fun special to watch, and we hope that you'll watch it with us. So that's coming up on Sunday. It will be released across our social media Uh ECL's take on Arthur, it's only rock and roll. We watch it with you in a full-length commentary. All right, so for Elwood City Limits, my name is Will Young, and for JV, what do you got to say? I don't want that kind of attention. (laughs) JV, it has been a true pleasure, and I hope that you'll be back soon. Thanks a lot for coming on, and we'll see you folks next time on the next Elwood City Limits.